Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. In this, the final episode of our Strata Data Conference series, we're joined by Zachary Hanif, Director of Machine Learning at Capital One. Zach led a session at Strata called Network Effects, working with modern graph analytical systems, which we had a great chat about back in New York. We start our discussion with a look at the role of graph analytics in the machine learning toolkit, including some important application areas for graph-based systems. We continue with an overview of the different ways to implement graph analytics, with a particular emphasis on the emerging role of what he calls graphical processing engines, which are systems that excel at handling large data sets. We also discuss the relationship between graph analytics and probabilistic graphical models, graphical embedding models, and graph convolutional neural networks in deep learning. Capital One is a longtime supporter of my work in this podcast, and I'd like to spend a big shout out to them for sponsoring this series. At the NIPS conference in Montreal this December, Capital One will be co-hosting a workshop focused on challenges and opportunities for AI and financial services and the impact of fairness, explainability, accuracy, and privacy. A call for papers is open now through October 25th. For more information on submissions, visit twimlai.com slash c1nips. The letter C, the number one, nips. Also, a huge thanks to our friends at Cloudera, who also sponsored this series. If you didn't catch my interview with Cloudera's Justin Norman earlier in this series, you'll definitely want to check it out. Cloudera's modern platform for machine learning and analytics, optimized for the cloud, lets you build and deploy AI solutions at scale, efficiently and securely, anywhere you want. In addition, Cloudera Fast Forward Labs' expert guidance helps you realize your AI future faster. To learn more, visit Cloudera's Machine Learning Resource Center at cloudera.com slash ml. If you're a fan of this show, please show some love to our sponsors and make sure to tell them that Twimble sent you. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am at Strata in New York City, and I am here with Zachary Hanif. Uh, Zach is the Director of Machine Learning at C4ML, that's the Center for Machine Learning at Capital One. Uh, Zach, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. So Zach and I go back a little bit. Yes. Uh, he was a guest presenter at the AI Summit uh, that I did in um, actually not even the AI Summit. It was the Future of Data it Summit. Future of Data so it was Summit. The yep. year, the, it was a year and a half ago or something yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah. Why don't we start out by having you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure, no problem. Um, so as, as I said, my name is Zach. Uh, I've, I've spent probably about the last decade working inside of machine learning and large-scale data analytics. Um, the specific domain that I, I, I've traditionally worked in has been in the area of security and kind of adversarial domains. So paying attention to cybersecurity, fraud, uh, money laundering, all sorts of things like that, where you kind of play a cat and mouse game with the entity behind your data uh, to try and keep something safe and to keep it protected. Uh, so I've been doing that for about 10 years in a variety of different contexts. Uh, and for the last two, two and a half years now at Capital One, uh, I've been a, a leader in Capital One Center for Machine Learning, uh, helping Capital One kind of bring machine learning into every single corner, every little area of, of the business as a whole uh, to kind of spread out the, the future, so to speak. Mm, awesome, awesome. And I interviewed Adam Wenchel, yes. uh, who heads up that center not too long ago on the podcast. So for folks that uh, want to learn more about the center and, and what the center is up to, we had a really great conversation about um, how an organization like Capital One, particularly with all of the constraints that a financial services organization has, how an organization like that builds out a capability for data science and machine learning. Uh, and we'll link to that show in the show notes. Uh, but Zach, you've got a presentation later today, actually, 
Well, what's the title of your presentation? So my presentation is about uh, doing graph analytics over large data sets. And it's a survey at the end of the day of uh, modern open source technologies uh, and techniques for doing graph analytics and machine learning over graphs. I'll be perfectly honest, the title suddenly escapes me. Uh, as, as Sam knows, as Sam knows, I, I just got off the train coming up from, from, the, from the DC region, which is where I'm based out of. So my head's a little all over the place. Um, but but the, uh, the talk as a whole is kind of an examination of how we use graph analytics and how I've used graph analytics in the past to solve a lot of very hairy problems, specific, especially inside of uh, security and uh, uh, cyber defense domains. Why don't we start by having you uh, give us some examples to contextualize, you know, what motivated this look into graph analytics? What are some of the use cases where it's been helpful for you? Absolutely. So, so graphs are helpful really anywhere where the connectivity of your nodes, the connectivity of your data is relevant. The topology of the data is relevant. Uh, many fields have uh, data sets where individual records really aren't related to each other. Um, there's, a, there's a very well-known trial data set, which pretty much any machine learning engineer probably deals with at least once when they're getting an understanding of how to do machine learning in a practical sense. And it's this data set of flowers. Uh, some, some researchers somewhere went out and collected the petal lengths and widths and other as physical dimensions of flowers uh, in, in a study in an attempt to determine whether or not machine learning could differentiate different types of flowers from each other. In data sets like that, those data sets don't really have, uh, each element of data doesn't have a relationship with any other element outside of the class that that particular row represents. Graphs are useful in kind of the opposite area where every single, no every single element that you have has a relationship or some kind of interconnectivity with other, uh, other elements in your data set. So where measurements of flowers aren't really interrelated in and of themselves, the relationships between people or the relationships between entities definitely have a great deal of contextual information embedded inside of their the relationship itself, right? So uh, to kind of to kind of put a fine point on it, uh, you and I have a relationship, obviously, as a result of our previous collaborations and as a result of this particular discussion here. Now, you and I both have individual elements of data associated just with ourselves, right? We're different right. people, obviously, but we are interconnected. Uh, and, and that interconnection in and of itself contains valuable information that we can learn from, which we wouldn't be able to learn if we just simply looked at yourself or myself uh, kind of in isolation. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. Can you make it more concrete by talking about specific business applications that you've looked at? Absolutely. Um, right now, my group is using uh, graph analytics to gain a better understanding of uh, money laundering and other financial crimes that people attempt to commit using the modern financial system. And as Capital One is very much a part of the modern financial system, we will occasionally have individuals attempt to perform uh, uh, criminal activity, you launder money, or something like that. Mm. Uh, you know, inappropriately using Capital One's uh, 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 capabilities, right? And so, our job is to utilize graph analytics to detect this kind of activity occurring uh, and make sure that it is dealt with. Uh, in an appropriate fashion so that it doesn't affect either any of Capital One's customers, anyone else in the United States financial system, uh, or doesn't pose the kind of moral and legalistic threat that the uh, uh, activities that generate this, this kind, these kind of funds can represent. Hmm. Yeah, I imagine folks that are outside of the financial services industry might not have an appreciation for the amount of regulatory pressure that banks are under with regards to anti-money laundering, AML, um, uh, but also the amount of investment that banks make in fighting money laundering. It's, it, it comes up in a lot of different areas. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very important. Um, Capital One's regulators have a, a very vested and, and very good interest in making sure that the financial security of the United States remains strong. Uh, and so they've, they've definitely taken an appropriate stance in making sure that we are vigilant about making sure the activity that goes on through our bank is appropriate. Um, and we take that responsibility very, very seriously, uh, investing both internally uh, and, and working with, you know, working collaboratively with academics and other researchers and other organizations who specialize in this to make sure that we're as uh, correct as we can possibly be. Because, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, it's, it's a very significant uh, uh, responsibility on our part. Mm -hmm.
And so uh, you found graph analytics to be useful here. When I hear graph come up, I tend to immediately think of a handful of different things. On, on the one end of the spectrum, I think of uh, graphic, graphical models, mm -hmm. like from a machine learning perspective, but I also think of graphical databases. Yes. It sounds like you're incorporating graphical databases for mm -hmm. sure. Are you incorporating graphical models as well? We're actually incorporating a lot of things across that overall spectrum, right? Okay. Everything from graphical models, um, which would be things like obviously graphical uh, Bayesian networks. Uh, there are some more modern uh, techniques being used inside of the deep learning space for generating graphical embeddings. Uh, and of course, the, the traditional algorithms in the area of performing label and belief propagation, right? These are all different areas that you can apply uh, inside of the probabilistic graph modeling space. We absolutely do do that. In addition to that, we're working not just with graph databases in the vein of, say, something like Neo4j or something like Titan or Janus Graph, for example. We're also working with graph processing engines, such as um, the material uh, inside of Giraffe, uh, Apache Giraffe, I should say, uh, Apache Spark, uh, GraphX, Graph Frames. Uh, I believe Flink even has a, a, a graph API behind it, uh, and even some more esoteric systems as well. Um, so we're really trying to cover the entirety of that spectrum um, because uh, having a diversity in our modeling approaches really allows us to kind of explore the entire space, and it gives us lots of options to try and find the best way to solve the various problems that we're attempting to address. Mm. So what's the best way to walk through that? How do you cover it in your talk? Do you kind of go bottom up or top down or so, use case out? I'm, I'm actually going in my talk, uh, starting with uh, kind of uh, go, going in the direction of starting with graph processing engines, okay. comparing and contrasting them with graph databases, okay. uh, and then finally talking about uh, what is kind of a, a, a pet project that we've got going on right now, um, which is exploring neural network applications inside of graphs. Okay. I, I chose that flow um, because of uh, a conversation that I actually had about four or five years ago. Uh, four or five years ago, I was uh, working with a, a couple of my colleagues at another organization uh, and preparing a talk uh, on using graphs inside of uh, malware networks. So getting an understanding of how malware is interrelated. Uh, it was a different role that I was in, a different company at the time. And I was talking with some of my coworkers uh, at this organization, and one of them mentioned to me uh, that they were curious to know how we were going to make this kind of graphical uh, model scale because he said that in his experience he, there were a number of graph databases and they didn't scale very well at a certain level of nodes and edges and he said well how are we going to get around this right and over the course of this conversation it kind of became it, it I think it became clear to the both of us that there's there's a much wider variety of different things inside of uh, inside of the graph analysis space that not everyone is is completely aware of um, certainly because of th events like strata and the the larger big data movement that came through uh, several years ago and is still very much ongoing, we've got a really great understanding of batch processing and stream processing systems. But graphs are still kind of a niche application inside of that space. And so kind of as a direct result, when people think graphs, they think graph databases, and they naturally think of some of the scalability concerns of graph databases in that space. Uh, and and they don't always, they're not always aware of kind of the, the, the related material uh, inside of graph processing engines and some of the probabilistic graphical models and other ways to kind of solve and tackle this problem while dealing with a model uh, in a graph space. Mm. Uh, so let's walk through this the, the, the way that you do in your presentation. Uh, graphical processing engines. Sure. You know, what are they, you know, what are they doing for us? How do they help you solve these problems? So. Any kind of graph computation engine, graph processing engine, is going to be a system that's similar to uh, the way we think about the relationship between Spark and Hadoop or uh, HDFS, right? You have some system that works on some series of data, either in memory or with disk flushes, right, disk caching. Uh, and it allows you to model your data as a graph and operate it operate on it with uh, a graph DSL or using, you know, graph uh, formalisms, right? And so a couple of clear examples in the software space uh, are um, GraphX, which is attached to the Spark project, GraphFrames, which is a library that's being built into and around GraphX, uh, Apache Giraffe, which is a, a BSP style uh, graph computation engine that's modeled after uh, Google's Pregel. Um, there's a now defunct project, I believe, called Apache Hama 
um, or if it's still ongoing, it's definitely died down in, in its activity. Um, you said BSP? BSP, Bulk Synchronous Parallel. Um, okay. It's a model of computation which is very extensible uh, and, and applies well to working with graphs in a distributed environment. Um, it works primarily off of the, the concept of performing message passing between individual nodes or vertices uh, in the graph and passing messages along the individual connective edges. It allows you to take a vertex-centric view of your graph, which allows you to calculate aspects of, uh, of each individual vertex based on the connectivity of that vertex to its neighbors. A good example of this would be something like um, belief propagation or reputation propagation, where individual entities may or may not have some known level of trust inside of the graph, and they propagate that trust to everyone else around them for multiple humps with some kind of decay value attached. Mm -hmm. What this functionally allows people to do is allows them to label a set of nodes, propagate those labels and say, based on the things I know about and based on what they're connected to, how do we, how do we start adding labels to those other nodes? Uh, it allows us to specifically inside of the, the uh, work that we're doing right now, it allows us to say, hey, we, we suspect this particular entity of performing some kind of mon money laundering or fraudulent activity. And I've seen that this person has transacted with 10 people around them. Mm. I don't have any view of the 10 people's reputation around this individual. What should my view be? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a suspicion by association model. Uh, the way you describe the, the BSP, mm -hmm. it makes me think of you know, as opposed to a, a, a top-down analytical operation on this graph, you're almost treating the graph as a distributed system. Yep. And like each of the vertices in the graph is transacting with its neighbors and, you know, accumulating, for example, certain properties. And then, you know, you, you allow this to happen over time and then you can take a look at the, the graph top down, I guess, and yes. learn about these relationships. That's absolutely the case. Um, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a really great way of kind of expressing how BSP works in practice. Um, it, it's, it's a very interesting distributed systems uh, 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 architecture because it allows the graph itself to kind of compute in its own manner. And then there's a concept called a super step where, you, where every single vertex turns around and says, okay, I've done all the things I need to do. I'm confident that there's no more work for me to do here. When your graph says, hey, each individual node is complete, then at that point you say, okay, we take a look at the entirety of the graph. We see if it's reached convergence or some other stopping function and then do any kind of work that we have to do at that level. And mm -hmm. then we allow the next stage of computation to continue again. Were you comparing these different graphical processing engines in your talk or really just sharing that they exist and what some of the major capabilities are? So it's really more of an overview. So sharing their major capabilities and kind of what makes them special and when you should be using them, mm -hmm. right? And I think one of the big takeaways that I'd like to communicate to the audience is that we should be using these graph processing engines when we want to work with very large graphs that don't fit well into memory and we're attempting to perform some kind of computation on those graphs to calculate a value for each vertex or a large subset of the vertices uh, in the graph that isn't easily expressed in a traversal based system, right? Uh, or, maybe, or maybe complicated enough so that way each of the individual nodes kind of affects all the other ones around it, right? By doing this, it kind of allows us to do the thing that Spark and other distributed processing engines are really great at. It allows us to take a large amount of data, iterate it on it very quickly in memory, right? And then present a result or more likely a long series of results, right? Uh, for the user then to interact with in a more interactive method elsewhere. And I think that one of the things that I communicate in the talk, uh, or I try to communicate in the talk, is that we want to use this in the same way that you would use Spark. We don't use Spark generally speaking, for truly interactive analytics. You could build probably a text search engine in Spark or something like that, but it's probably better to do those computations in Spark and then load that into something like Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that kind of model as applied to graphs is one of the things we're talking about. And that's my transition point from talking about graph processing engines and graph computation engines to talking about uh, graph databases themselves. Before we jump into graph databases, the systems that you mentioned, well, certainly Spark exists in the, the Java ecosystem. Uh, a lot of machine learning uh, is happening in the Python ecosystem. And uh, 
Uh, I asked, actually asked the uh, previous uh, interview guest this mm -hmm. question earlier. Are you seeing any activity in this graphical processing um, realm in that Python ecosystem? There's a lot of graphical interest going on inside of Python. It's mostly expressed in the area of probabilistic graphical models because there's so much, uh, like such a strong ecosystem around scientific computing inside of Python. I think the JVM ecosystem is seeing a little bit more in the distributed systems space mm -hmm. for similar reasons, right? There's a lot of material that already exists for building distributed systems, especially when we're talking about uh, graph processing engines that are built kind of on top or with a lot of the same fundamental concepts as some of the more traditional processing systems, Spark, for example, right? Um, it, w it makes plenty of sense to allow uh, these uh, the developers to kind of have that historical uh, historical basis and use those historical tools. One of the things we're seeing a lot of, however, is that in the same way that Spark has PySpark, uh, we're also starting to see Python implementations of GraphX and Python implementations of Graph Frames that call out to uh, JVM-based systems on the back end uh, or performing similar computations uh, themselves in a, in a Python manner. Uh, I think one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of excitement inside of, inside of the Python space for graph processing is not in the distributed system space, but in the single node space, um, which is actually really exciting because there's a lot of stuff that you can do um, that is arguably even more efficient uh, in terms of uh, uh, certain metrics uh, on a single node as opposed to multiple nodes. And this has been discussed in academic literature over the last couple of years from about 2015 on. There's been an ongoing discussion in uh, distributed systems, the academic literature for distributed systems, talking about kind of what is the configuration that outperforms a single thread and things like that. And so it's kind of interesting to look at the, you know, kind of the two different areas where we're seeing a lot of this development. And there's a great deal of sophisticated graph processing libraries uh, meant for single node work uh, in the Python ecosystem, running from Network X to other more sophisticated tools uh, that, that are very relevant. Okay. So each of these camps is kind of building on their respective strengths, Java on the distributed computing side, Python on the scientific computing side, and data science side, and kind of building extensions and bridges yeah. toward the other side, but those historical strengths kind of still remain. Still remain, right? And I, I think that's something that we want to encourage inside of computer science as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. You know, identifying those foundational elements that have strengths and allowing them to be good at them while opening up APIs and, and bridges, as you said, to allow people who don't have necessarily that specific uh, uh, underlying knowledge of that foundation or that language element to be able to use those systems effectively. This is this is a little bit of a this is a little bit of a, a, a fringe area, but there's a lot of graph process. There's a fair amount of graph processing work going on right now, uh, even in in the uh, compiled language space. Um, so right now there is a there is a researcher uh, by the name of Frank McSherry uh, who is doing a kind of spiritual successor to the NIAD system that was uh, hosted and published and worked on uh, at, at Microsoft Research. And uh, it's called Timely Data Flow. And there's there's a lot of work going on there. Um, and, and he is a incredible researcher. And I've heard his name before. Yes, yes. Uh, he's he's involved in a lot of things. He was one of the authors of the cost paper I referenced earlier. And okay. kind of one of his major research areas is understanding distributed systems and when do we need a distributed system and when do we need a single node system and doing high performance computing. And so he's been using Rust recently to do a lot of very interesting things, uh, exploring what data flow, you know, the data flow model of computation is uh, and exploring how that can be applied to uh, uh, more traditional uh, data processing problems as well as graph processing problems. Um, I mention this simply because I think that the, the area that he's working in is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and while that work I don't think is entirely production ready yet, um, because, I mean, by his own admission, you know, the work that he's doing is he's exploring the space and doing a lot of research. I think, I think that there's a lot of stuff that's going on there that's bearing some very meaningful fruit. And uh, I think people inside of the distributed system space should definitely be aware of kind of those, those discussions that are going on. Mm. Uh, you also mentioned a project uh, out of Google. Uh, what was that one? Pregel, P-R-E-G-E-L. 
Pregel? Yes. Um, much like the MapReduce paper, uh, which you know was was launched some time ago and then kicked off a whole right. whole new revolution <laughs> in open source computing. Uh, Google published another paper slightly there uh, uh, a couple of years after, uh, called uh, which, which describes a system called Pregel, okay. um, in which they describe building a system internally uh, that they built out and in some cases, if I remember the paper correctly, uh, they said that it had. Um, turned into one of their primary uh, processing engines, uh, competing with or supplementing or assisting MapReduce, right? Their MapReduce implementation internally at the time, at least. Um, and and they called it Pregel, which relied on the BSP style, uh, uh, BSP model of computation to perform these large distributed graph computations, right? Uh, and if you take which a look, you can imagine that they have tons of to do. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> and 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 I mean to be to be completely uh, you know clear, right? I'm fairly sure that they they published this paper, and I have no idea how it's used internally or if it's still being used today. I, I don't know anything about that, um, but it was a fascinating paper when they published it at the time because it kind of exposed the concept of doing distributed graph computations, how they solved particular hairy problems in the space. And they also exposed kind of an API, the internal API that they're utilizing and saying, okay, if you define a system that has the following properties, it would be similar to the Pregel system we have internally. And this is how we've modeled that style of computation. Again, very similar to their original MapReduce right. and HDFS papers, right? Or GFS for them, I suppose. Um, and so that's a it's a, it's an interesting system. I'd I'd love to know what's happened to it since the uh, since the publication of that paper. But unfortunately, I don't have that insider knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what's the open source project that's uh, implemented that? Uh, giraffe, G I R A P H, Apache Giraffe. Okay. Yeah, I may have misspelled that. Um, uh, Apache Giraffe is the project I believe that's the closest BSP style um, uh, implementation uh, since then. I think that um, while both uh, Jelly, which is the uh, graph processing system attached to Flink, uh, and GraphX, which is the graph processing system again attached to Spark, both have um, Pregel operators, so you can use the Pregel API. Um, my understanding is, is that the back end is informed by the BSP style model of computation, but has been continually developed and, and represents kind of an, a, a, a bit of a step uh, in, a, in, in a slightly different direction. Meaning the back end of the giraffe. Uh as opposed to the the flink and the yeah the back end of giraffe I believe is much more similar to the original publication of the of the BSP model of computation, uh, whereas um, both um, my understanding is that uh, both uh, Spark the GraphX system right. uh, and Flink's system uh, were informed by it, okay. uh, but are not as tightly tied Got it. to the BSP style, and so. You transition from talking about graphical processing engines to graph databases. Absolutely. Um, what, how do you see kind of the state of the art there? And or, or maybe let's go back to the original uh, flow. Like what's the role of the graphical database in helping you solve the kinds of problems you're solving with the with graphical networks? So in the in the architecture that I propose, right? Uh, I propose that that users are probably best suited to use a graphical processing engine to compute most of the values that they need, right? To modify all of the properties in their graph, right? And then to output those results into a graph database, which is much much easier and much more native for humans to actually interact with. I think in my I think in my talk I actually go out and say you know we've we you know someone does a whole bunch of math on things and that's great, but at some point humans need to actually use the resultant uh, uh, data. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I, I I state is that because graphical processing engines are capable of doing large scale computations but are not designed for interactive analytics, for example, saying, show me all the friends of this particular individual, filter that list by the following criteria, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, I, uh, one of the things that I, I suggest is performing as many of these computations as possible beforehand. So if you want to do a label propagation or something like that, you do that in your graph computation engine. And then you load the graph with all of those uh, computed results into a graph database which is designed for people to interact with and allows you, often comes with, uh, dedicated uh, uh, domain-specific languages for doing uh, uh, traversals very efficiently and very easily and very natively, right? So in the same way that we probably wouldn't do dynamic style analytics using 
Spark, usually, we would want to provide an analyst with a SQL front end to be able to do that sort of thing. That's kind of the same model that we're, we're applying here. You compute as much as you can inside of your processing engine, and then you pass that material over to a graph database, which actually allows someone to interact with it. Uh, now, historically, graph databases have had some degree or another of this graphical processing mm -hmm. capability built in. And, you know, if only because, you know, they the graphical processing engines weren't standalone. They weren't popular as standalone mm -hmm. uh, components. Um, so, for example, Neo4j has long had a, a you know fairly well developed you know graphical um, programming model. Yes, that you can use for data that's in the database. Mm -hmm. Is the is the idea behind separating that out strictly a scalability? Um, notion or are there other reasons why you'd want to do that? Well, I think there's two main ones. Scalability is absolutely one of the main cases. Uh, I think the second one ultimately comes down to how you're comfortable expressing certain concepts inside of that graph um, to, to kind of relate it back to uh, a topic that I think you know, probably all of your listeners have worked with in the past, SQL, right? Mm -hmm. SQL is a Turing complete language, but there's plenty of programs I wouldn't want to write in SQL, right? right. Um, just because it's Turing complete doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy or that it's, it's really the tool that's designed for this particular purpose. Right. And so while um, Neo4j, as you referenced, uh, historically had the Gremlin interface, the Gremlin query language attached to it, and I believe now supports the Cypher query language, um, uh, I wouldn't suggest that either of those query languages are always the best choice for all of the graph computations you may want to compute, right? So even ignoring possible possibilities of you know benefiting from a distributed systems environment, right, for scalability, um, the way you are able to express your computations uh, may be benefited by working in one environment or the other. Um, possibly due to my background, possibly due to my own biases, I generally have an easier way of thinking about graphs from a vertex or a graph-based centric model of computation. And so I tend to favor that. Um, that combined with the scalability metric is kind of where my recommendation comes from. And is there an emerging you know, GQL kind of analogy to SQL for the interface between the graphical processing engines yes. and the graphical databases? That is a super hot topic. Okay. Um, so, so, uh, I think, I think that probably the easiest way of handling that is doing your, doing your computation first, emitting that in, let's just say for the purposes of discussion, CSV or JSON or something like that, and then loading that into your graphical database, right? Okay. That may be a little inelegant at some level. <laughs> it sounds it, inelegant. <laughs> it, is, it is, but it definitely works. And actually there's a couple of, uh, there's a couple of new services coming out that make doing that particular path a little bit easier. Let's, let's put that to the side for just a second, okay. right? Um, one of the one of the things one of the projects that's definitely being worked on right now is uh, an interface to GraphX utilizing the Gremlin query language, um, and I think I think that that's one very interesting way that you would be able to go about go about doing this, uh, and I, I I would be I would be reasonably certain that that would allow you to kind of uh, dynamically load some data into various graph databases that that may exist out there, um, or at the very least, it's an area that I'd like to see some development kind of go into. There are new graph processing systems getting, uh, not just graph processing systems, gra graph databases getting published on a regular basis. Um, one of them is AWS's Neptune, um, which I should at this point insert my common disclaimer. I'm a gentleman at Capital One, but nothing in here when I talk about any technologies <laughs> is Capital One telling you to use any of these tools. I'm merely expressing the fact that I've used them before and I've had various results but I'm not a mouthpiece for my company when I'm talking about this. <laughs> Sorry, got to do that. Um, but uh, Neptune is a Neptune is a new uh, 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 a graphical offering from AWS, um, which has a lot of interesting properties, um, including saving snapshots of your data into S3, reloading snapshots, reloading data uh, dynamically, which might actually take the somewhat inelegant method um, that I described kind of at the beginning of this, uh, you know, area of the discussion uh, and make it a little bit more uh, workable mm. depending on the situation. So it's things to think about, right? Um, 
taking that from kind of, uh, I, I think I talk about mostly just dynamically, uh, just loading your, your data, you know, taking a snapshot, loading it into a graph database in my talk. And I talk about that specifically because that's something that's relatively easy to understand and, and discuss and doing something in a more dynamic fashion or a less elegant fashion is a matter of engineering and not always a matter of capability, right? Uh, and as a result, there's a lot of, there's a lot of area that you can play in there. And that's really judged by what's your use case, what kind of uh, reliability and, and speed guarantees you need to fulfill. And that differs on every single area. Um, so I'm trying to describe more of a, more of a model of, architecture more so than these are the specific links that I that you definitely should be using um, mm -hmm. because all these graph systems at the end of the day they're really specialist tools even though some of them are becoming more um, uh, you know uh, I, I don't want to say generic but more generalized frameworks or being built on generalized frameworks I think graph uh, computation is something that is very very tied uh, to the kind of work that you're attempting to do and the kind of uh, the kind of space you're operating in. And as a result, you want to be very sensitive to your use case at every single stage uh, of the operation. Hmm. And, and so maybe taking a, a further philosophical detour, do you think that the in this space we need something analogous to a standard query language? Um, or Conversely, do we not need it because of what you just said that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the architectures and the way we build these applications is very use case dependent? Or is it the case that kind of times have changed and if the relational database was being invented now as opposed to however many years ago, you know, maybe we wouldn't have a SQL because we're so comfortable kind of throwing around JSON and manipulating it on the fly, that kind of thing. So it's funny, it's funny you bring that up. Um, I happen to be a proponent in the general case, uh, certainly for graph databases and other traversal based systems, uh, to say that a common query language is likely to increase adoption. I think having the SQL standard is what allowed SQL databases to become as large as they effectively have, um, just simply because of the fact that you knew that you could train a series of people in a particular uh, in, in, in you know a particular style of SQL and it would probably transfer in 90% of its volume to any other implementation of the SQL standard as expressed by MySQL or by Postgres or by Oracle or so on and so forth, right? right? Um, there's obviously some caveats there, but in general, I think that that led to many, many good things. Um, I would suggest that standardization around a query language or a standard for query languages is probably something that will have similar beneficial effects as well. Um, I've got my own thoughts on which ones I think would be interesting to have, but and I know those are. Huh? Oh, there we go. That, <laughs> I, I gave you an opportunity. Uh, I actually favor Gremlin quite a lot, okay. um, but that may be because that was one of the first graph DSLs that I really worked with or spent any kind of time with, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's probably a bias that I have there. But I, I like the I like the standard as a whole, and I think that that organization has done a uh, has done a good job of stewardship. Uh, Tinker Pop. Uh, the Tinkerpop organization used to be a standalone company, which before that it was a research project um, from from one of the key developers, uh, and they've transitioned it into kind of a public Apache project since then. And so I'd like seeing that chain of stewardship moving forward, and that's that's part of that key part of creating a creating a, an eventual standard. Um, I think there's a lot of good things about it. Um, so so I, I that's that's one of the areas that I would go in. But one way or the other, I generally believe that standardization for query languages definitely can lead to good things and at a bare minimum definitely leads to um, uh, uh, kind of a, a greater ease of acceptance. Um, certainly less uh, shock when you deal with a new system for the first time. It's funny you bring up the the statement of you know chucking around JSON and some of the more modern database families uh, moving away from SQL because I think we've actually seen I, I'm remembering back to when kind of the big wave of uh, distributed key value stores started pouring out into the Apache projects and, and, the, and the JVM ecosystem again. Um, systems like Cassandra, um, for example, mm -hmm. which originally was a pure key value store, right? Uh, around, I think it was Cassandra 2.0 when they started uh, integrating the literal CQL query language into it, mm -hmm. which looks very similar to SQL. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think we've I think we've seen that with a couple of other uh, 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 da uh, databases, which which kind of just talks about SQL's overall uh, kind of cultural dominance, the the hegemon the hegemony that it represents is mm -hmm. is kind of very interesting. The right. database's role is almost like a 
you know, almost like if you're if you're using a database to serve up a model, like you're building the essentially building the model, the graphical model using the processing engine, and then you're taking that and sticking it in a database for more interactive use. I, I, I think you're right. I, th I think at the end of the day, you're definitely serving the results. I don't know if I want to say you're serving the model because it's almost a little bit more restrictive, right? Because your model in, in a standard machine learning environment, if you're just serving a model, uh, you're definitely just serving one particular thing that takes a defined input and exports some yeah. kind of defined output. Whereas for a graph database, you've got a lot more flexibility. You can actually write your own queries. And at some level, you can write secondary stage analytics on top of that if you if, if that suits your use case. Fair um, but you're definitely right. It would be serving kind of a, a pre-digested at some level, some kind of digested result uh, in, in a interface that's maybe a little bit more native to your use and utilization. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then, so the next part of your talk is is then starting to look at graphical models from a machine learning perspective, uh, and uh, potentially even you mentioned graphical embeddings, which is uh, I'm very intrigued as to the direction that that goes. Uh, so, uh, graph convolutional neural networks uh, are a uh, very active research field currently. Uh, and I caveat any discussion about them by saying that, like, from an academic perspective, the academic community still isn't completely decided on whether or not they are a good approach, how powerful they actually are, and what's going on. Mm. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest, and there's a lot of papers that have been published that speak to kind of different techniques and different approaches and different ways of thinking about and working with this, uh, which have published positive results and material like that. But as anything inside of academia, two years, three years is not really enough time to kind of come to a global consensus on things, right? Um, even in the larger neural network space that we're seeing right now, there's still discussion on like, what are we actually learning and how are we actually sure. doing it, right? Um, and so in a, in a you know, more specialized area of that, larger, of that larger discussion, something that's, you know, even, you know, uh, uh, at some level newer and has, has fewer researchers kind of staring at it, of course, that same discussion is ongoing. One immediate question I have is, has a standard data set, a training data set emerged for uh, graphical operations? Like, is there an image net for graph stuff? You know, that's, that's interesting. There's actually a lot of different data sets that are frequently cited in literature in okay. general, right? Um, there's, there, and they range from the very small to the very large, right? Um, Stanford, uh, the SNAP data sets. Uh, Stanford publishes, uh, I believe it's Stanford, but it's the SNAP data sets, publishes this large list of publicly available um, graph data sets. And they include things like the uh, uh, trust relationship of the website Slashdot. Um, I don't know if I, I'm not sure what the uh, demographic age range of your uh, of your audience usually t tends towards, but uh, if you if you're an individual of a certain age, you probably remember Slashdot. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's old old kind of things before Reddit and Dig and all that other stuff. So um, the the trust graph of Slashdot is one of those data sets. Um, Live Journal uh, had a friendship listing. Uh, there's Twitter follower graphs going all the way down to the very small, which are things like kind of a famous graph testing data set called Zachary's Karate Club, which is, I kid you not, uh, a, a uh, collection of, I think, uh, just a very, just a couple handfuls of individuals inside of a youth karate club associating who identified as friends of whom, hmm. right? Um, so there's and less than- you publish this data set? This isn't me. <laughs> that that data set predates me. Uh, it just happens to share a different Zachary entirely. Um, uh, uh, but but so so there's there's a number of these data sets that have been published, uh, which are very well studied. Okay. Um, and so there's a couple of them um, that get get changed about. And and because of the fact that um, you know ImageNet ImageNet has a lot of benefits for it in that it's a very large, very general. All sorts of different images are contained therein. Uh, graphs, which model kind of the interconnectivity of individual nodes, mean that attempts at getting one standard kind of data set are going to look very different. The PGP Web of Trust looks very different than your Facebook association, than your LinkedIn association patterns. Everything looks, looks a little different. Looks very different in what sense? Uh, the number of things that you connect to, 
um, how, how willing you are to connect to certain things. Uh, and kind of the the general level of interconnectivity of of individual nodes, right? Um, I would say that probably on on social media sites, Facebook and Twitter and things like that, you're highly incentivized to connect with a large number of people, um, people that are your close close friends and people who are acquaintances that you've interacted with a few times before, or even in the case of I guess both of those websites, uh, people who you don't know personally. Uh, but they produce content or have opinions that you find interesting, and so you want to subscribe to them to get their material sent to you, right? Um, as opposed to, say, say something that's much more uh, uh, intentional, um, the PGP Web of Trust, for example, for people who you know use encrypted communications for signing emails and things like that, um, those are intended to be very intentional communications, right? You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, state in that kind of web of trust that you trust an individual you've never met before. You probably only trust individuals that you've deliberately sent mail to who you know are the people you want to talk to, things like that, right? So is the idea then that the popping it up a level, the density or sparsity of the networks is dramatically different in uh, and maybe just not the, the the level of density, but some quality of the density is different. And that, you know, because the the methods that we use to process these graphs are very sensitive to that, it doesn't make sense to have some general uh, data set. Yeah, I would say that's I would say that that's a good way of of describing it, right? Um, it's 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 the way the graph was formed, it's the way the graph evolves over time, you know, kind of all these things are embedded in the actual structure of the network itself. Uh, and so as, as kind of a result, um, I would suggest that when when looking at you know papers discussing graph computation, you'll usually see, especially looking at systems papers discussing graph computation, you will see uh, individuals uh, publishing these papers study the way their algorithm or their system performs over multiple different graphs. Okay. Um, simply to to be aware of that. But there are there are definitely a series of of these well published, well understood, well uh, studied uh, graphs out there. Okay. So not quite like ImageNet, but not that different. So then these graphical uh, neural networks, what's, uh, can I give us a snapshot of the, the state of the state there? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so the, the intuition behind it is, um, can we use a neural network to gain an understanding of individual vertices in a graph, right? Uh, and over the course of a series of papers, the concept of, cre of using neural networks, effectively modified convolutional neural networks, to uh, get an understanding of an embedding of individual nodes inside of a graph has come about. So in the same way that we kind of look at um, data that is traditionally maybe a little difficult to vectorize or very, very sparse, and we want to build a denser representation uh, of, of that data, word to vec being kind of the most famous example, but there's all sorts of, you know, star to vec and all sorts of other things mm -hmm. running around right now. Um, we would want to do that for graphs as well, because for graphs, right, if you look at it in terms of like an adjacency matrix, adjacency matrices in large graphs uh, are almost necessarily very sparse. Um, there's only so many people that you can possibly know. There are so many people in the world, and so no matter how many, no matter how well traveled or, or or social you may be, you'll never really make a dent, a meaningful dent in the over overall population of the planet, right? So for a theoretically maximal social graph, right, right. Um, it's going to be a very sparse matrix. Mm -hmm. Working with sparse matrices is very difficult. There's all sorts of mathematical properties you run into to say nothing of like space requirements and things like that. Uh, and so one of the one of the things that people would w wanted to do is you know to come up with an embedding matrix to take kind of each of those individual things and bring it to an in, uh, a, a a easily or more easily described point in space uh, that you can perform distance measurements on right uh, and and graphical convolutional networks are a means to do such a thing and it's an active area of research right now there's all sorts of different levels of debate going on about it which is which I personally find fascinating. Um, and, and one of the things I talk about in my talk is kind of what are they and, and a couple of different ways that you can, you can work with them to some degree. One of the things that I'm currently experimenting with now uh, is getting an idea of whether or not we can use graphical, uh, the results of these embeddings, I should say, if we can use these embeddings to perform more like this queries. So let's say that um, we identify that there is a fraudster 
somewhere. We know that this person has committed fraud. And we know that the pattern of which this person was committing fraud is somehow distinct or unique. Mm -hmm. And one of a, a, an investigator asks themselves, how do I find more people like this? Can, I sh can you show me some system out there? Can, can I be shown a listing of individuals who have similar patterns uh, of their of their transactions or of the way they behave inside of inside of the the financial network that may lead me to believe that there are hey there's more people like this this is a newer emerging trend this is something we can look at uh, and and getting an idea of what that looks like uh, we're currently exploring the use of embeddings to be able to kind of see what that uh, see what that gives us and how how we work with that and so in the talk I kind of express that idea exp you know introduce the concept of embeddings and talk a little bit about how you would serve embeddings in a manner that would allow you to do more like this queries in something significantly more efficient than you know o to the n squared time which mm -hmm. is always fun you uh, mentioned that it's very early in this space um, are there specific areas where it's been or what are the characteristics of areas that has been demonstrated to be a useful technique? So there's a couple of areas, uh, most of them in the areas of uh, kind of clustering, graph coloring, and, and uh, uh, association into groups, so finding community detection. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the one that I've spent the most of my, most of my time uh, looking at. There are a handful of others, of course, in, in the space as a whole, but I would suggest that that's probably the most fruitful initial area, identifying communities inside of a graph, which is a very difficult problem. What is the pre-processing or training um, that's required to train up one of these graphical neural networks? Is it, are you basically kind of vectorizing your graph in some kind of way as some huge sparse vector and just feeding that into a standard CNN or have we changed the so it's a, model I mean, architecture? Like as, <laughs> as with everything, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but yeah. that's, that's a good kind I, I of- I imagine yeah, so. <laughs> that's, that's a good high level, a high level representation. At the end of the day, you're still working with that adjacency graph, right? Yep. The, the adjacency matrix. And you're still passing kind of the, the window that you're working on over the, of the neural network over that adjacency matrix. Oh, well, so that's a get, thing right there. It's like, hey, we've got this huge connectivity um, or, or the, the connectivity of our graph can be express, expressed as this huge sparse matrix, yes. but there's no way we're turning that into a vector and feeding it to a network. We're yes. windowing around within this environment. Kind of like, I guess you can think of it as a convolution. I guess that's the whole point of that's this is point, that... Yeah. And and feeding feeding the data into that convolution um, for the for the particular techniques that that I'm working with right now are very similar to performing kind of a random walk through that graph, mm -hmm. right? So you're following this random walk, you run a series of those random walks, and then that gets you kind of what you're looking for based on a particular starting point, and you feed that, which is effectively a subgraph, into your neural network. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of papers I'll send you a few after after okay. we talk a little bit today, because um, right now the majority of the work that I'm doing in, in in that particular space is working with techniques that have been you know kind of published and, and discussed and trying to see whether or not they give reasonable results. So that I'm trying to effectively I'm trying to find you know kind of where what the best area to dive in is based on some experimental trials in the data sets that we're working with now. Mm -hmm. um, so for a kind of a, a deeper mathematical based understanding, um, I'll send you a paper or two, and I think you'll be able to put it up for, for your listeners or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know off the top of your head the some of the key researchers who are working in this area? I'm terrible with names, so I wouldn't be able to tell okay. you off the top of my head. We'll, sorry. We'll, we'll include it in the show notes for sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh, and fortunately, um, many of those researchers are really good about doing kind of reproducible research. Um, so many of them have published the, the implementations they had uh, for awesome. their individual papers on GitHub. Um, and, and, you know, it's always really great to see it when, when researchers do that kind of work. Absolutely. That's, that's always amazing. Absolutely. So we've walked through these kind of three elements of your presentation. How did you sum things up for folks? So effectively, I, I try to sum things up by drawing an architectural diagram saying like, you know, if you're, if you're working with large scale graphs, if you have problems similar to kind of this set of things, you may want to consider an architecture that looks a little bit similar to this, right? Uh, where your underlying layer is some kind of large block data store. Um, you have a graphical processing engine directly over that reading from that and performing its computation. 
patient, feeding those results through some means and mechanism into a graphical database, and then serving the results of that graph database either directly through interfacing directly with the graph DB itself or through a series of APIs, a RESTful API or even a graph or something well, like yep, that. Yep, exactly. Something along those lines, right? Because at the end of the day, the goal of all of this material, right, is to enable some kind of analysis, to enable some individual to perform useful work over that data. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and so providing that in different different avenues in different ways is definitely relevant because you'll have extremely technically and te technical and sophisticated uh, investigators or analysts doing direct line queries into the database, and you'll have others that are uh, consuming that material through reporting or through uh, kind of a, a a guided interface in some form or fashion, depending on what your use case is. You will probably be in some spectrum there, uh, and so as a direct result, we want to make sure that you have the ability to communicate those results uh, to kind of all of those different use cases. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it sounds like an awesome talk. Zach. Well, I'm glad Thanks you so much so. for yeah. uh, taking some time it's to share it with us. Been a pleasure being here. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on Zach or any of the topics we covered in this show, visit twimlai.com slash talk slash 188. For more information on the entire Strata Data Conference podcast series, visit twimlai.com slash strata ny 2018. Thanks again to our sponsors, Capital One and Cloudera for their support of this show and this series. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.